Good morning, everyone. Please take your seats. Welcome to uh, the first Monday speaker this, of the series. My name is Kyler Van Berkham, co-chair of Student Symposium. And on behalf of the co-curricular committee, the Andrea Center, I am pleased to introduce Dr. James Smith as our speaker this morning. Dr. Smith is a professor of philosophy and holds the Gary and Henrietta Biker Chair in Applied Reformation Theology and Worldview at Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He also teaches in the Department of Congressional and Ministry Studies and is a research fellow at the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship. In addition, Dr. Smith has authored several books, including Letters to a Young Calvinist, Desiring the Kingdom, Worship, Worldview, and Formation, and Who's Afraid of Postmodernism? Please join me in giving a warm Dort College welcome to Dr. Smith. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I see the Dutch microphone height is in full effect. It's great to visit Dort again, always a pleasure to come uh, to what I very much consider a sister institution of my own, and um, uh, I'm excited to spend the day with you and uh, visit some classes and things. Thanks so much for being here this morning. My theme for this morning is worship, worldview, and cultural liturgies. And what I want to invite you to think about, which is going to be ironic in just a second, but what I want to invite you to think about is how we think about culture. Uh, I want to invite you to kind of retool and recalibrate our um, models and paradigms for how we think about culture, cultural engagement, and cultural transformation. And I want to do so by actually inviting you to rethink who we are, what sorts of creatures we are, what sorts of beings that we are. And so in some ways, I want to invite you this morning to um, move from an emphasis in thinking about culture from the perspective of worldview to thinking about culture in terms of worship. Now, uh, does the word worldview ring any bells for folks? Is that a term that we're vaguely familiar with? Okay. Uh, um, Here's... here's Uh, uh, my sort of thesis, my uh, um, argument for this morning. I want to suggest, by the way, let me be clear. I love worldview. I think worldview is fantastic. I think worldview, I would marry worldview if I could, (laughs) right? My argument is not that there is a problem with worldview. My suggestion is that worldview just is not enough, It's not a robust enough framework for us to make sense of culture and the dynamics of cultural formation. And the reason is because we, as human beings, are more complex, fully orbed kinds of creatures who are more than thinkers. And that's what I want us to, here's the irony, I want us to think about the implications of appreciating that human beings are not only thinkers. A number of years ago, I was reading Christianity Today magazine, I came across a big color advertisement uh, in which there was a man's face um, and emblazoned across his forehead were the words, you are what you think. You are what you think. The advertisement was actually for a Bible memory verse program, and the idea was that if you are going to make someone into a disciple of Jesus, if you are going to sort of transform them so that they exhibit Christ-like life to those around them, one of the most important things we can do is change how you think. And what I found so intriguing in this this claim, you are what you think, tied to this Bible memory verse program, is that it assumes a picture of human beings that I actually think is not entirely biblical. 
It is a flattened, reductionistic, rather simplistic picture of human beings that assumes that we are thinking things. And so this approach to discipleship, this approach to Christian formation, assumes that the way to make you into a Christ-like person is to deposit all of the right information into your intellectual receptacle. And if we can just get all the right information into your head, then you will become the kind of person who does what Jesus calls, uh, calls you to do. So in a, in a way, this model of Christian education, Christian formation, and, and discipleship functionally assumes that human beings are thinking things. Now, um, I want to suggest that that's actually a very modern, fairly recent, and quite reductionistic way to think about human beings. It's not that we don't think. I'm not saying that. It's just that we are not only thinkers. We are not wholly and entirely defined by what we think. So this claim, you are what you think, I want to suggest actually might not be entirely true. Or at the least, it doesn't tell us everything about who we are as human beings. And if we unwittingly adopt this, uh, um, this sort of thinking thingism, uh, sometimes I call this a bobblehead picture of human beings. Do you know what bobbleheads are? You go to the baseball park and, and you get, uh, if it's like a really cool day where you get bobbleheads for the first thousand people who attend, um, you get these dolls and they have like this humongous, ginormous head and this itty bitty body, right? And this ginormous head bobbles around. Well, in a way, I think a lot of North American Christians have a view of human persons that is this sort of bobblehead picture of human beings. We have this wholly sort of head-centric view of what Christian formation and discipleship and education is, and we assume that we are brains on a stick. We assume that we are thinking things, and therefore we assume that cultural formation and Christian formation is primarily about getting the right ideas and beliefs and doctrines deposited into our intellectual receptacles. My, I want to suggest this morning that that is a wholly inadequate way of thinking about human persons. That you are not just what you think. In fact, you might not be what you think. <laughs> and in fact, there can be disconnections significant disconnections between what you think and what you do. Uh, I, I have an uncomfortable way of, of trying to get at this story just because it's a, an admission of my own failure as a husband. But it, it goes something like this. So my wife Deanna is a passionate foodie. Do you know what I mean? So she's, she's really, really passionate about eating well and eating healthy, and she's a master gardener and a gourmet cook, and she has her own garden plot, and she creates all of these great meals for us to, to help us eat healthily, and um, I'm a very non-compliant husband, that's why I look the way I do, but she wants the best for us. She's also very passionate about just good food systems, about the, 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 the systems and practices and institutions that create and produce and distribute food in our culture. So she's a big fan of, of authors like um, Barbara Kingsolver or Michael Pollan. Or, it just strike me, these might, might not be super popular people at Door College. Anyway, uh, uh, Wendell Berry. Wendell Berry would be another example. So for years, Deanna has been sort of evangelizing me and trying to convince me to sort of adopt this lifestyle. And so um, I, I eventually sort of conceded and I picked up an anthology by this author, Wendell Berry. And it was called Bring It to the Table. It's actually a great introduction to his thought. And I'm the kind of person who always has a book with me because you never know when you might have 30 seconds of downtime to kill. So I always would keep a book in, in my bag. And uh, I was just reading this voraciously and, and soaking it up and was completely sort of wowed by his argument and was really convinced and convicted by all of the things that Wendell Berry was saying. 
And then I realized, one day I was reading Wendell Berry, he was marking up all the margins and writing amen and check marks and everything, and I paused to sort of reflect on a point, and I realized that I was reading Wendell Berry in the food court at Costco. <laughs> now, I, do you have Costco out here, right? So, if you know anything about Wendell Berry and you know anything about Costco, Costco is like the sixth circle of hell in Wendell Berry's universe. Like it's, it's kind of a picture of everything that is sort of wrong with food distribution, uh, creation, production, so on and so forth. And here I am reading Wendell Berry, totally intellectually convinced by what he's saying and just mowing down one of those big juicy footlongs in the food court at Costco. Why do I tell you this story? Because it gets at this disconnect that I think we need to try to make sense of, which is this. I was completely intellectually convinced by Wendell Berry's ideas. That clearly did not translate into a transformed mode of life. So what is the gap and distinction and disconnect between me understanding, accepting, and agreeing with a set of ideas, and that actually turning into a way of life that I live out. I want to suggest that if you just work with this thinking thing picture of human beings, you actually won't be able to account for the gap that happens there. Because if you work with a thinking thing picture of human beings, you will also tend to assume a particular account of human action. And you will tend to see action as primary, or you will assume that action is the outcome of rational, deliberative choices that we make. So if you have this brain-on-a-stick picture of human beings, you think that we are what we think, then you will also tend to assume that we do what we think. But I was reading Wendell Berry in Costco. There clearly is no straight line from what we know and what we believe and what we think to that translating itself into a way of life. Why? Because thinking thingism is a reductionistic, simplistic picture of who we are as human beings. And our action is not so much, is often not the conclusion to some sort of rational, cognitive, deliberative process it, in fact, our, uh, in fact, a lot of our action bubbles up out of us and is driven by the power of habit. And I want to suggest, we'll, come, we'll return to that theme of habit in a moment, but I want to suggest that the thinking thing view of human persons actually does not have any way to account for the power of habit in our lives. It doesn't have any way to account for the power of bad habits, and it also doesn't have any positive place in its view of education, formation, and discipleship for good habit. So I want to suggest to you this morning a very different alternative way to think about who we are as human beings. What sorts of creatures are we? Are we thinkers? Are we defined by what we think? Or what about if we tried this model? What if it's not the case that we are what we think? What if instead we are what we love? What if human beings are not primarily and the fir- for the most part thinkers, but lovers? Mild, awkward silence. Great. Here, I want now, hang on. For, I'm not, this isn't like a honeymoon commercial for the Poconos or something. I'm, I'm, I want us to think through what I believe is a fundamentally biblical intuition that what defines you is what you love. So if I really want to know what makes you tick, if I really want to get at the very core and fiber of who you are, I am not going to ask you, what do you know? Because the fact is there are all kinds of things that you know that don't define you in any way at all, right? I'm not going to ask you, what do you think? I might not even get at the very core of who you are if I ask you the question, 
What do you believe? If I really want to tap into your identity, if I really want to get at the core of who you are, here's the question I want an answer to. What do you want? What do you want? What do you long for? What do you crave? What do you desire? What do you love? The 5th century North African bishop, St. Augustine, wrote one of the great spiritual classics of the Western tradition, which I'm sure you encounter at some point here at Dort College and which you should all keep on your shelves for a lifetime of Christian formation, called the Confessions. The Confessions is, in a way, Augustine's spiritual autobiography, and the entirety of the Confessions is actually written in the mode of a prayer. And in the very first paragraph of the Confessions, Augustine prays this prayer. You, praying to the Lord, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. You have made us for yourself. Do you notice there's kind of a design claim there? You have made us for something. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. That, to me, gets at an alternative, more holistic, more complex picture of who we are as human beings. The center of your identity is not your mind or your brain or the intellectual container in which you house all of your ideas. According to the Scriptures, the center and core of who you are is this biblical language of the heart. And now, one of the things, here's a, here's a challenge we have. Almost everything that we have learned about the heart, we have learned either from Hallmark or Oprah. And you have to forget all of that, okay? Because we're not talking about soppy, mushy, sentimental stuff, okay? We're, we're, that's not what we mean by, that's not what the Scriptures mean by heart language. It's not what St. Augustine means by heart language. What's interesting is, the, the New Testament word for heart actually refers to something more like your bowels. <laughs> and, and in some ways, to resist the sentimentalism of heart language in our culture, we should maybe translate that word gut. This is the, the visceral seat and core where your passions are located. And I think Augustine's prayer you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you, suggests an alternative way of thinking about human beings, not as thinkers, not as believers, not as knowers, but as lovers. That what defines us is actually, as human beings, we have been made by God to be creatures who desire God, who are made to long and desire is a good thing. Is that because do you think that's another thing that's happened? Is do you think if a lot of us have sort of a negative connotation to the word desire? Like it sounds like something you're like, mm, that can't be good. Let me, let me, uh, um, I leave tomorrow so I can say this. Let me, let me, let me make this even more interesting, okay? There's a Greek word for love that you've probably heard sermons about in which you've been told this is bad love because this is eros. We know agape love. Agape love, that's good love. That's, that's good Christian love. Eros, that sounds erotic and that can't be good. So eros love is like bad love. Agape love is good love. No. False dichotomy. For St. Augustine, agape... Love is rightly ordered eros. To be human is to be lovers, is to be longers, is to be made to desire something. To be human is to be erotic in a way. To be defined by what you fundamentally long for. 
But to be truly human is to fundamentally and rightly long for the Creator who is revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Do you get a feel now for, this is a very different picture of what it is to be human. What defines you now is not the set of ideas and beliefs and doctrines that you've got uh, uh, contained in your intellectual receptacle. What defines you is what you want what you long for, what you desire. And so the center of the human person in this picture is this heart, this cardia, our gut, our longings, our loves. To be human is to be a lover, and God made us that way. In fact, the effect of sin and the fall and brokenness on this reality is not that it turns off love. The effect of sin on the fall, on this creational structure of being made to love God and being made as desiring creatures, the effect of sin in the fall is not that it turns off love, it's that it misdirects our love. We become oriented and long for and crave rivals of God. We come to be the sort of people who are oriented to substitute gods. But what we are defined by is still what we love. So the question isn't whether you love. You can't be human and not love something fundamental, something ultimate. That's what it is to be made in the image of God. The question isn't whether you love. The question is what you will love. So if you work with this alternative model of being human, what defines you are your longings, your passions, your most fundamental and ultimate desires for what you think you are made for. Sometimes I, I, I use the term, uh, um, this, is, this is your version of the kingdom. What do you think life is ultimately about? What is the version of the good life that you are, that you are longing for at this gut level? We have been made by God to desire God and His shalom that He has in store for the entirety of creation. But the effect of sin in the fall is that as lovers and desiring creatures, we actually come to love and long for and desire all kinds of rival versions of that, that are idolatrous substitutes that will never satisfy. In fact, do you remember that Augustinian prayer? You have made us for yourself. And our hearts are restless until they rest in you. For Augustine, you can't not love. And so what will happen is, is if you don't find your rest in the creator for whom you are made, you will spend your life looking and longing and desiring and trying to satisfy that passional nature that you have in all kinds of substitutes that will never, ever, ever satisfy And in fact, that's the story of Augustine's confessions. The first half of the confessions is Augustine trying to find his love in all kinds of substitutes and none of them being able to satisfy. Living his life in a restlessness, an angst, an anxiety that could never be satisfied. In in the words of one country song, he spent his life looking for love in all the wrong places. Deeply Augustinian intuition, looking for love in all the wrong places. So, on this model then, you are defined by what you love. The most fundamental passions and orientations that you have aren't just what you think about the world, it's what you want ultimately. And the effect of sin and the fall is to in a way, bend and twist and misdirect our loves to idolatrous substitutes. Now, here's the uncomfortable part. Um, I said to you before, if I really want to know who you are and what you're about, I'm not going to just ask you questions like, what do you know or what do you think? I'm going to ask you, what do you love? Now, here's the problem. You all know enough to know what the right answer to that question is, right? So if I ask any of you, your good Dort College students, if I ask you, what do you fundamentally love? 
You know what to say as the right answer. I know what to say as the right answer. But here's the problem. What I love at this fundamental visceral level actually might not be what I think. And the reason for that is because of one last aspect of this model that I want us to appreciate and then think through the implications of. Here's the, here's the deal. Love, as we're talking about it here, desire is not an emotion, right? We're not just talking about some sort of sentimental feeling or emotion. We are talking about a, a fundamental passional orientation to what is ultimate, And the thing is, that kind of orienting love is not something that you think your way into. It's not something that you wake up on a Monday morning, you know, you've heard this fantastic sermon on a Sunday, and you wake up on a Monday morning, you're like, all right, everything is going to be different. I get it. I'm totally convinced from here on out. This is going to define my love. We've all been there, right? How does that work out by about mm, Thursday? Do you find that that way of thinking about your orientation is not very sustainable? Why? For this reason. Here's the last aspect of this picture. Love is a habit. Love is a habit. Now, what do we mean by that? Philosophers and uh, theologians throughout the West from Aristotle on have tried to think about the nature of habit in this way. Habits are internal dispositions that you acquire and learn that make you lean in certain directions without having to think about it. So, from Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas, and others, good habits, good moral habits, are what we describe as virtues. Virtues are these internal dispositions that you have learned and acquired so that you become the kind of person who is, sort of by second nature, compassionate or courageous or charitable. Vices, obviously, are bad moral habits. So here's the question we have to ask ourselves. If love, longing, desire is fundamentally this kind of passional habit, it's not just something I make a choice about, it's something that I acquire over time as a, as a, a disposition, in fact, that I don't have to think about. If love is that kind of habit, then we need to ask ourselves, how do I form my loves? How does my love get aimed at the end for which I was made? Also, we can ask ourselves the other question, which is, how does my love get deformed and misdirected? Here's where and why we need to think differently about culture and cultural formation. Because the insight of, I think, this this particular Western philosophical and theological tradition is that your loves are aimed and shaped and trained by practice, by the practices, by the social communal rhythms and rituals that you are immersed in. So your loves are not just the outcome of intellectual conclusions that you have reached. Your passions and loves are habituated in a certain direction towards an ultimate version of the good life. And that happens not primarily intellectually, but sort of in some ways under the radar of intellectual reflection, or at least under the hood of your conscious awareness, in ways that your passional orientations are being formed by the communal rhythms, rituals, and practices that you are immersed in. So I want to stretch a word a little bit and use it as a shorthand in this way. I want to use the word liturgy or liturgies, as a shorthand term to describe communal, social practices, rituals, and routines 
that shape your most ultimate and fundamental loves. Okay? So liturgies, which I know is a very kind of churchy word, but I'm trying to stretch the term a little bit, to name a kind of cultural practice, rhythm, and ritual that is doing nothing short of impacting and training your loves, is shaping and orienting your heart. Liturgies are love-shaping rituals, heart-aiming rituals. Now, why, why should all of that matter for how, <clears throat> excuse me, we think about culture for this reason? If liturgies are social, communal practices, rituals, and routines that shape your most fundamental loves and longings, then the thing that we need to appreciate is those liturgies are everywhere. I'm using a churchy word, but the fact is that some of the most powerful liturgies that shape my loves and longings have nothing to do with our usual religious institutions. In fact, what we might need to start thinking about is what we could call secular liturgies. Now, we're analyzing culture. So think of us, uh, we're engaged in a cultural analysis here, but we're not coming to it with a thinking thing model of the human person. Because if you have that sort of approach, what will happen is when you do cultural analysis, you will spend your time trying to figure out what are the ideas and messages that are out there in culture. Which is all, that's all, that's great, fantastic. Let's not stop doing that. However, if you just bring that kind of thinking thing approach and are fixated on cultural analysis in a way that you are looking for the messages and ideas and beliefs in culture, what you will miss, what your cultural analysis radar will not pick up, is actually the incredibly powerful, formative practices in culture that might not be trying to change your mind, but actually are trying to train your heart. Let me see if I can make this a little more concrete. I, I'm a philosopher, so like, I'm really comfortable at about 15,000 feet above ground, but let's, see, let's zoom in a little bit. Um, so I have uh, four kids, two in college, two uh, in high school. When they were teenagers, um, they would sometimes say, Uh, come to me and say, Dad, can you take us to the temple? Now, we're not Jewish. Uh, What they meant was, will you drop us off at the mall? And when when they would ask me, and they're usually sort of mocking me as they do this, which is, you know. uh, But it grows out of a conversation we have had in which I try to impress upon them that the mall is not a neutral space. That the mall is, in some ways, not, uh, well, actually, in some ways, the mall is a deeply religious site. Why? Because it is a liturgical space with very intentional communal ritual patterns that try to embed and train in them a vision of the good life in such a way that they will become the kind of people who long for that. In other words, if, if the gospel of consumerism is captivating a generation of even North American Christians, it's not because you walk into the mall and somebody meets you with like a tract and says, here's the 16 things that the mall believes. Do you know what I mean? Like, you don't walk into the mall and emblazoned on that big directory is, well, here's the doctrines of the gospel of consumerism. It's not an intellectual project. They're not trying to convince your intellect, but they are trying to capture your imagination. And the way that that works, so, so think of it this way. The mall isn't just a place, um, going to the mall isn't just something that you do. It's doing something to you in some ways, especially over time and if you're not very reflective about what's going on there. 
And so when our kids would ask, can you drop us off at the temple, I considered that a small victory on my part because it actually means that they realize that it's not a neutral space. Because when you walk into the mall, it's not an intellectual conviction experience. It is a capturing of the heart's loves and longings kind of experience. And it does that in ways that are remarkably liturgical in a sense. If you've ever visited a grand Gothic cathedral in Northern Europe, it's very hard to shake the sense that our malls have a kind of, they are cathedrals of consumption. And the way that that works is you, you enter into a space and a time that sort of transforms your experience. And whereas in the, in the uh, um, cathedral, the, the walls or the windows would be lined with images of the saints who are exemplars of the life which we should imitate, in the mall you are surrounded by 3D exemplars of the good life wearing Forever 21 and H&M or whatever it is, and who is sort of embody now the life that you want to imitate. And the way that the gospel of consumerism seeps into us is not by convincing our intellect, but by capturing our imagination. And so the liturgies of these cultural institutions carry in them a particular vision of what human flourishing is, of what the good life is, and over time inscribe in us a kind of love, a kind of longing. Our imaginations and loves are shaped by that. I I always, it's, uh, I I pick on them all. I'll do an example that picks on me, okay? So I am... um, a not very successful recovering NASCAR addict, okay? So I actually really love... I used to think this was a secret, but I tell hundreds and hundreds of people of this, so it's obviously not a secret anymore. But, so I actually really love NASCAR stock racing. But I struggle with this, well, for all kinds of reasons, but uh, um, for at least this reason, a NASCAR race... The opening, especially, of a NASCAR race is an incredibly powerful liturgy. The opening of an NFL game, especially the Super Bowl, can work the same way, but think of it this way. At the opening of a NASCAR race, there is an incredible display of power and might and religion all woven together in a liturgy and a ritual that maybe isn't sending messages to my mind, but is clearly impressing upon my loves a vision. So in in case some of you are not familiar with uh, the opening of a NASCAR race, um, first of all, 100,000 people attend a NASCAR race, okay? So this is, a, this is a big deal. And in that space, you know, there's all this raucous noise and everything until the noise reduces to hearing a pin drop at the start of the national anthem. Have you ever asked yourself why we listen to the national anthem at sporting events? I'm just asking. I mean, if, you go, if I go to the opera or the symphony or the ballet, they don't start with the national anthem. Why do we start sporting events with the national anthem? Now, I should, I see perplexed looks. I'm Canadian, so you can take all of this with a grain of salt, all right? But, so the, the, the raucous roar of the, of the uh, track comes to a standstill as everyone stands and covers their hands, their hearts with their hands and stands for the, for the national anthem, at which there will be a, an American flag that is, you know, 100 yards by 50 yards being sh- woven and shaken by little children who are so excited to show it rippling in the wind. And then, again, I don't know if you noticed, but the American national anthem is slightly militaristic. Just a little bit of sort of war mythology that is bound up, and so you start. And, and uh, um, by the way, I forgot to tell you, every NASCAR race also opens with a prayer. Weird. Weird, 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 weird stuff goes on. When you start blending this powerful evocation of national military might and a story about the myth of the nation, coupled with some local pastor who prays uh, in connection with that. And then the end of that ritual always ends with a military flyover of some sort. If there's no F-16s, we will find 
Huey helicopters from some local Air National Guard thing, but there's going to be some visible, tangible, visceral expression of military might that chugs across the stadium. And if you've ever witnessed a military flyover, you actually don't see a military flyover. You feel it right here. And what I'm suggesting is this is a liturgy which is not intellectual but is deeply affective that tells a story about something ultimate and about who we are and congeals in us an orientation to a version and a vision of the good life that seeps into our bones through the mythology of those liturgies. Friends, this is exactly why as Christians... I think there are two implications of this. Of if, if something like this liturgical desiring model of the human person is right, and if something like this liturgical analysis of our culture is right, and by the way, you can spin all kinds of analyses, contextualized analyses of secular liturgies. And in a way, you, you have to do that where you are in your context. There liturgies can be the most unassuming micro-rituals in some ways. Uh, um, there's, I, I learn a lot from beer commercials because actually some of the most brilliant marketing minds in our culture write beer commercials. So if you want to know anything about a culture, watch beer commercials, okay? I'm not saying drink beer. I'm just saying, well, I'm not saying don't. Anyway, okay. So uh, uh, um, there was a beer commercial. It was for Michelob Ultra, worst beer ever, uh, um, in which, for some reason, Lance Armstrong was in this commercial, and um, it's a bunch of guys, it's a beer commercial, okay, so a bunch of guys come out of their office complex, and it's the end of the day, they're going to go out for a drink, obviously, and they come out to the curb, and the guy's car there that they're going to ride in is there, and uh, um, they're, his car, lame, lame, lame car, that's not the car that they want, so they do this. What's that motion? It's this motion. I don't want that car. I want a different car. So they're on the, it's a beer commercial, right? Oh, they're transported to the beach. A um, bunch of guys on the beach, they see off in the distance a bunch of young ladies that they're interested in. Again, beer commercial. Um, they're, they're intrigued by these young ladies, but they're a long ways off, so what do they do? They do this. Zoom in. And it's a beer commercial, so they are immediately interested in the guys because they are drinking Michelob Ultra. They go to a club. The DJ is playing music that they don't like in the club. So what do they do? Once again, whoosh, immediately appears the music that they want to listen to. What I, what I think is so brilliantly insightful in this 30-second television commercial spot is the insight that this machine comes with a mode of interface that is a kind of micro-ritual that over time unconsciously trains me not only to relate to my phone this way, but to relate to the world this way. Because on this phone, I can have what I want, when I want it, on my terms, to keep me happy, and so I won't be bored. And in a way, this micro-ritual becomes a rhythm that trains me that I am kind of the center of the universe. And before you know it, that starts to spill over in ways pictured in this beer commercial that train me to have that same expectation from the macro world that I inhabit. If this analysis of human persons has anything going for it, it's to wake us up to all of the unconscious ways that we are being trained to love and to heighten perhaps or recover a sense of antithesis with respect to many of those cultural formations. But ultimately, it's a positive outcome, and I'll close with this. This is exactly why we as a Christian community need to recover and reappreciate the power of Christian liturgical formation.
that what makes us disciples of Jesus, what will transform us and habituate us and make us a kind of people who love and long for God's shalom in the whole of his creation, it's not enough for us to just have the right ideas and beliefs about that deposited in our heads. We need to rehabituate our loves. We need to retrain our longings. And in some ways, the greatest gift for that is to inherit and receive historic Christian worship practices that carry the story of the gospel in them. I think one of the things that we need to take seriously in the coming generations is to stop trying to figure out the next new novel best way to do church and in fact remember and recover historic, tangible, embodied, concrete liturgical practices that already imaginatively carry the story of God in Christ reconciling the world to himself. For us as a generation and as a people to be immersed in those practices is to have our loves rehabituated. And in that way, we will be trained and formed by the Spirit through his grace to be kind, become the kind of people who desire the kingdom. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Smith, and thank you everyone for attending this month's First Monday Speaker Series. Dr. Smith will be with us again this evening at 7.30 in the Ribbons Academic Complex, Classroom 1144 and 1148. He will be presenting his lecture titled, The Secular is Haunted, Inhabiting Our Cross-Pressured Present, in an effort to describe what we mean when we refer to our time as a secular age. I hope to see you there. Have a great day.